Facebook family and friends. I'm glad that you could join me tonight. This is our first Tuesday night Bible study. And um, first of all, I just want to give thanks and praise to the Lord Jesus and God for opening up this opportunity for allowing Tuesday nights to be open on the schedule so that we could spend some time together. What I'm hoping for and my prayer in these Bible studies is just that we would take some time together to study scripture together, kind of keep it loose. Um, we definitely have uh, things that I would like to share with you. But what I want to do is encourage you uh, and in, and hopefully inspire you and give you the motivation to not just read the Bible, but to study the Bible for yourself. Let's face it. There's only one book that God wrote, and it's called the Bible. It is the Word of God. Now, there's many people that don't believe that the Bible is true, or they just believe it's an archaic book from thousands of years ago, and it has no bearing on today's world, but it does. The Bible is the only book that tells you how the world began, why it's in the mess we're in, and how it's all going to end. And so if we're serious about our Christian walk and our Christian faith, the very foundation of our faith is the Word of God. It is the Bible. And so I just want to praise God for these Tuesday night Bible studies, and I pray that you are going to be uh, blessed by them. Now, um, I want this to be interactive, and I realize that some of you have signed on, and thank you for signing on. But if you have comments or you have questions along the way, and we can dialogue, that would be great. I don't want to keep it as uh, as regimented as maybe a Sunday message would be, where I'm just preaching at you. This is a Bible study. And um, God had laid on my heart the chapter 1 Kings chapter 13. And the more I was reading it, and the more I was studying it the last couple of days in preparation for this, the more the Holy Spirit just revealed to me. And there's some backstory that we have to cover first before we can actually get into the chapter. So I'm going to do that tonight. I also want to let you know, too, that I, I don't want to make these Bible studies really long where you have to sit through 45 minutes or an hour of me talking, something like that. I want to kind of keep them short. I want to keep them to the point, but I also want them to be interactive. So please feel free to, to comment or ask a question or whatever you want to do. This is our forum together, and, and Lord willing, every Tuesday night at this time, we will be together. Now, in researching 1 Kings 13, we are going to meet a man who was a man of God. He was an unnamed prophet. He was an unnamed man of God. But it seems to me that until we can get into that chapter and begin to see what happened with this unnamed man of God in 1 Kings 13, that we need to have a good understanding of what a prophet is. Do you know what a prophet is? Jesus talked about false Christ and false prophets. And then there was also true prophets. We read about true prophets throughout scripture, but we also read about false prophets. And so here's where I want to go to start with tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 18. If you have your Bible or your cell phone, however you want to follow the scriptures, if you're doing that, if you're taking notes, we're going to be in Deuteronomy 18. And we're going to look at verses 18 down through 22. And I want to show you a difference here between a true prophet and a false prophet. Because to me, um, we have to have an understanding before we can get into this passage that we're going to look at. And I can tell you up front now. Because the passage is so long, this will require two or three different studies to actually get through 1 Kings 13. There is so much there, I was actually overwhelmed as I was uh, preparing and studying for it. So I don't want to overwhelm you. Like I said, I want to try to keep these loose, but we want to stay focused on the Word of God. So if you're with me in Deuteronomy 18, let me show you something. In verse 18 and verse 19, we read this statement. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Do you know who God is talking about there? Jesus. Verse 19, And it shall come to pass, that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. There's going to be a penalty to pay for everyone who rejects Jesus. Did you know that? In that passage in Deuteronomy, he's talking about Jesus Christ in those two passages. Remember, a biblical um, good rule to keep in mind. Everything in the Bible points to Jesus. Everything. Everything. Whether it's a ceremonial law, whether it's a sacrificing of a lamb, whether it's one of the prophets speaking, everything points to Jesus because Jesus was the Word. And the Bible says the Word was with God and the Word was God. And so everything that has to do with God's Word has to do with Jesus. We want to keep that in mind. 
And so having looked at this in Deuteronomy 18, in those first two verses, that's talking about Jesus. And we know that he was a prophet. He was a good prophet. But we believe that he was more than that. He was the son of God. He was the Lord and Savior if you've accepted him. There are some people, many people in this world, that just consider Jesus to be only a prophet. They look at this and they say, oh, he was only a prophet, but we know more. We know that he was the true and living God, that he gave his life for those who would believe on him. You're absolutely right, Valerie. There's too many false prophets out there. That is very true. Now, let's look at this. Verse 20 through 22 of Deuteronomy 18. Will you look at this? But the, now here's the, here's, he just gave you what a true prophet was. Here's a false prophet. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follows not, nor comes to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Do you know what God is saying there? There's a picture of a false prophet. If somebody is prophesying something and it doesn't come to pass, they are a false prophet. That is why we have to be very careful what we say. When, when I preach and when I teach, it is from the Word of God. I'm reading the words. I'm expounding on the Word of God. But Lord knows there are a lot of people that are prophesying things that are just not true. I make no judgment on them. That's up to God. That's between them and God. But if you know the Word, and the more you know the Word, the more you can recognize when a false prophet says something. And we got the instructions right here. If they say something, that God has not said. First of all, that's that's a key right there that someone's a false prophet. But if they say something and it doesn't come to pass either, false prophet. We can just write them off. And the Bible says here, you shall not be afraid of him. See, if we know the truth, a false prophet can't hurt us. Did you hear me? If we know the truth, then a false prophet or a false prophecy or something brought against us cannot hurt us. Hallelujah. Cannot hurt us. Thank you for those who are joining, uh, who came in a little bit late. Glad to have you here. Thank you to, uh, to be here on our first Tuesday night Bible study. We're keeping it kind of loose here. And I want it to be interactive. So uh, just the same way Valerie had mentioned something. And even to those of you who may be watching this, on, not live, but on a rebroadcast, if you have a question or you have a comment, feel free to add it in. I want this to be interactive. And uh, I want it to be a, a, a place where we can be together, where we can learn from God's word together. So now that you have, I hope that you have a better picture of what a false prophet is and what a true prophet is, because it leads right into what we're going to look at. We're going to start looking at 1 Kings chapter 13 tonight. So if you have your Bibles or however you're doing that on your iPad, however you follow along, we're going to 1 Kings chapter 13. And as I said, um, there is so much here. There's no way we can cover all this tonight. Probably not even next week either. We're going to be doing this over several weeks. But I'll tell you, this is a, this is a passage that is just rich with truth. And I'm not sure if, you know, I don't think in my life that I've ever heard anyone preach out of this chapter before. But it is a fascinating story. Uh, doesn't end well for the man of God. I'm going to tell you that right now, for those of you who don't know the story. So let's get into this here in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. Yes, exactly. Exactly. There's always someone trying to twist the word to fit their teaching. You're absolutely right. We have to be careful about that. It's like I just said, the more we know the word, the more we can recognize when somebody is twisting it and, and, and telling you something that's not true. And the only way we can know the word, my friends, really is to not only read the word, but study it. Study the word. Study the word. The Bible says to study to make yourself approved unto every good thing. And it, it also tells us to always be ready to give an answer to those that ask about our faith. So I realize that not all of us are theologians. I'm certainly not. Not all of us are Bible scholars. I'm certainly not. But I have a desire, a burning desire to know what the truth is. And, and those of you who follow me know that I'm always posting. I'm always saying, if you want the truth, read the Bible. 
There's only one place for truth. That is the scripture. That's what we're looking at right now. We don't have to go anywhere outside of there. And what we want to do is, is test everything that we're taught against God's word, even what I'm teaching you, even what I preach, test it against the word of God, because all of us are fallible and all of us can make a mistake. It's the false prophets that deliberately twist things around that make things that, that, that are sending people to hell with false prophets and false gods and false worship and twisting around things. So you're absolutely right about that. In this writing in 1 Kings 13, we're going to be looking, we're going to start looking tonight at one of the saddest accounts in all of Scripture concerning disobedience and also divine judgment. Um, we know that if we sin, that we have to pay a price for that sin. God punishes us, and, and He should. I mean, the Bible says that any loving father will chastise his children. And if we're children and child of God, the same way those of us who are parents, we had to discipline and correct our children, didn't we? We had to. And so God in heaven is also correcting us when we need correcting. But boy, oh boy, I will tell you that this man of God here is in for a real rude awakening. But it's his own fault. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. So what we want to do here in 1 Kings 13, and I do want to be mindful of the time. I don't want to take up your whole evening with this. Let's start with the first verse, and then we actually have to backtrack a little bit, or you won't understand the, the scenario that we have here. In 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1, it says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Okay? So, we're going to begin our study of this chapter by being introduced to somebody who doesn't have a name. He's an unnamed prophet. He's simply identified as a man of God who came out of Judah. And the prophet is there by the word of the Lord, which means he was directed by God. God gave him a directive. God told him what to do. God, we're going to see this in the next few verses. God is going to give him something very specific that he wants this man to do. And so this is what we see at the beginning here. He was sent to Bethel for a very specific reason. But it is kind of odd that we see here because we have to go back and get context, okay? And I realize I'm going to throw a lot at you. But this is good for you to look over this week until we meet again next week with some of these passages I'm going to show you so that all of us can study this together and learn more. Thank you for all those who are joining. And yes, I'm, I'm going to mm. preach, Joanne. I'm going to preach as God gives me utterance. Now, let's get context here. To be able to understand why King Jeroboam is standing at the altar ready to burn incense, we have to go back to 1 Kings chapter 12. Now, we don't have to go through the entire chapter. I would encourage you to do that just for continuity's sake. But here's what we want to do, because God is making a reference to the word or the place Bethel here. It's the word of the Lord, Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So what are we talking about, Bethel? Let's go back to 1 Kings 12. I'm going to read a lot to you. Bethel was one of the two places of Jeroboam's calf worship. And then if you're not familiar with the story, well, let's pick it up in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 26, and we'll read down to verse 33. And look at this wicked man. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and they shall kill me, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel, and he made two calves of gold, and he said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel! which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You see what he's doing? He's holding up two golden calves to say, these are your gods, Israel. These are your gods. This is who you're going to worship. These are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and then he set the other one in Dan. They were two cities in his kingdom. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. 
And he made a house. Now look at further sin. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. Let me stop there for a minute. Do you remember back when uh, God was giving out the assignments to all the tribes in the land of Canaan? What did he give the Levites? He did not give them a parcel of land because they were the priests. And all the other 11 tribes were to contribute to support mm. the Levites. They were his high priests. The Levites were in charge of the temple and in charge of the services and all the sacrifices. But look what Jeroboam is doing here. He's picking people from the lowest of the people. They weren't even the sons of Levi. That's another sin against him. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month and on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. He copied Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. He's worshiping idols. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he made. He appointed priests himself. God didn't appoint them. Rotten Jeroboam did that. Look at all these sins. Sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. Because Jeroboam went against God. And this is where he's going to have the encounter soon with the man of God in 13. Let's finish this up. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. He made it up out of his own heart. Are you kidding me? He made it up out of his own heart. He did it. And ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar, and he burnt incense. There is the context. That is where we find King Jeroboam. When this man of God, this unnamed prophet, in 1 Kings 13, 1, that shows up in Bethel. Now, just to give you context, you know, when Solomon committed his sin, God had told Solomon that his kingdom was going to be divided, but it wasn't going to be divided in his, in his lifetime, but in his son's lifetime. So what we're seeing is we're dropping in on the Bible here at this point where the kingdom is now divided. We have King Rehoboam, who is Solomon's son. He is the king of Judah, that is the southern kingdom. And then we have King Jeroboam, who is the king of the northern kingdom, which is Israel. And that's why we see this man, it says, it came a man of God out of Judah, the southern kingdom, by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. He came into Israel, and Jeroboam here, we find him at the altar, ready to burn incense. Are you with me so far? Again, if you have any comments or questions, please chime in. This is this is loosey goosey. <laughs> it's not. Uh, I just want to share this word with you as God leaves it with me, but I don't want to overwhelm you either. So write these passages down. So now let's go on to verse two, verse two of First Kings thirteen, verse two. And he, that's this man of God, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, "O altar." Altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. What? That, that's, that's pretty complicated here. He's making a prophecy. And we're going to see the fulfillment of the prophecy, and I'm going to take you there because I need to, you to understand that this, this prophet, the, he was a true man of God, he was a true prophet because, as we looked at earlier, a true prophet will prophesy what God has said, and it will come true. And so let me just read verse 3 for you of 1 Kings 13. Now I'm going to show you how this came true. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent or torn, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Now that's the prophecy. That's what the man of God said to King Jeroboam, who's standing there at the altar ready to burn incense. Now let me show you. Put your finger in your Bible and come with me to 2 Kings 23. And I'm going to show you where this came true. And I need to show you this again so we have context and that we know that this man of God truly was a man of God. 1 Kings, or 2 Kings, I'm sorry, chapter 23, verses 15 through 20. Now remember, all of this happened here at, the, at Bethel, at the altar. 
Second Kings 23, beginning in verse 15. Here's the fulfillment of the prophecy. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place with Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place he broke down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. Now, where did we hear this name before? And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulcher and burned them upon the altar and polluted it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God had proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. What man of God is he talking about? The one back here in 1 Kings 13 that we're about to look at. So you can see that this prophecy that he made in 1 Kings 13 came true, every bit of it. Let's continue. Verse 17. Then said he, What title is he that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah, and proclaim these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. That's what we were looking at, right? That's what Jeroboam did. And he said, Let him alone. Let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. We're going to meet him soon. And all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away. Josiah was one of them good kings. And he did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. And look what else he did. And he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars, and he burned men's bones upon them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, okay, I realize I'm reading a lot to you, and you have a lot to, to look over this week, but <laughs> what are the odds? What are the chances that this a random person is going to come into town to the king and pronounce these, these bizarre things about bones being burnt upon the altar and the altar falling and ashes, unless it came from God? And we have confirmation. Let's go back to 1 Kings 13. We have confirmation twice. Because in verse 1 of 1 Kings 13, it says, There came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord. He was sent by God. And then in verse 2, it says, And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. He didn't speak in his own voice. He spoke in the verse of God himself. Amen. God himself. And so now, since I've probably totally confused you, we have context. And we have the fulfillment, and that proves, if you had any doubt, that proves that this man of God was a true prophet. Based on God's own definition of a prophet, everything that he said to Jeroboam came true. Everything. And we saw that in Second Kings. So let's move on here now. Let's move on to verse 4 of First Kings 13. Let's see if we can dig into this a little bit. Verse 4. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. That's verse 3. Verse 4. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, when he heard that, when he heard that prophecy, he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up or stiffened up, or froze, so that he could not pull it into him again. Did you hear what's happening? King Jeroboam is on the altar, and he says to his men, Seize him, get him, and his hand freezes. He can't move it. It's stiff. He's paralyzed. Okay? Recognize that. He's paralyzed. Just like that. Instant judgment came upon him. Jeremiah, or Jeroboam, I'm sorry, wants the prophet arrested. He puts forth his hand. As the king, he had every right to say, seize him. He gave the signal to arrest him, but before the order can even be carried out, his hand dries up. The king had been paralyzed. Let's look at verse 5. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Didn't we just see that? Now we see the fulfillment of what he said in verse 3. 
We already saw the fulfillment in verse 2, but now in verse 5, we see exactly what he said in verse 3. He said the altar is going to be rent, the ashes will be poured out. In verse 5, it says the altar was rent, the ashes were poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given, again, by the word of the Lord. Once again, coming with full authority from God. Full authority. But now we got poor King Jeroboam with a frozen hand. What in the world is going to happen? Well, let's take a look. Verse 6 of 1 Kings 13. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now, or plead, or beseech now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. A couple things. First of all, <laughs> He's only interested in himself, of course. It's a selfish move. But you notice that he says, Entreat now the face of the Lord, thy God, your God, not my God. Because Jeroboam is, is, is already off in apostasy. He's already off in sin. He's already got uh, phony statues and idols that he's worshiping. He's already got high places. He's already got priests that he assigned that aren't even Levites. So he's way off base here. And so he says, just ask Ask the Lord, your God, you know, just give me my hand back. Now watch. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again and became as it was before. Look at that. We just saw a miracle. Just like that, we just saw a miracle. One minute his hand is frozen, and one minute he can move it again because the man of God beseeched the Lord. But you know, Notice that the king only cries out for mercy for his own hand. You know, he's got all these terrible things going on. He's got these grievous sins going on. And, and really his only focus is on a physical miracle. I, I can't imagine how many people he led astray. And he would be responsible for leading those people astray. For putting up high places. For building those, those golden calves and bowing down to them in Bethel and in Dan and creating his own holiday, and creating his own priest. All these were grievous, terrible sins, and he's worried about a hand. But you know what? Even with that, I mean, I don't know about you, but if my hand was stiff one minute, and a man of God or a prophet or a priest prayed for me, and my hand suddenly became free again, I'd be on my knees worshiping God, wouldn't you? I'd be on my knees. I'd be thanking God for all of that. But we don't see that here, do we? No, we don't. But here's what we are going to do. We're going to look at a few more verses, then we're going to call it a quits for the night. Verse 7. And then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Hmm. Now, there's two possible reasons, really, for Jeroboam's invitation that I can see. One could have been, it could have been a really a sincere form of apology because... He attempted to arrest the prophet, and now his hand is fine. So it could very well be that Jeroboam was truly being, you know, he wanted to apologize. He wanted to apologize. But also, I think it was a device for softening or warding off the judgment pronounced against the royal household. You see, when the man of God prophesied this, didn't we see in verse 5 that the altar crumbled and the ashes but there was also a long-term thing that was going to happen when Josiah got on the scene. Now, we did see it fulfilled, but at that time, Jeroboam wouldn't have known that. And so I think there may have been a solve. If I can get on the good side of this man of God, if I can just do that, maybe I can ward off some of this. Now, watch what happens here in verse 8. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half of thy house, if you'll even give me half of your house, I will not go in with you. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. Uh-uh. You can give me up the half of your kingdom, and I'm not still going in with you. Why? Why did he say that? Verse 9. For so was charged by me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. Hmm. Now, wait a minute now. Let's analyze this for a minute, Okay. Here's the king and says, all I want you to do is come in and I'll give you a reward. And the man of God is saying, no, I was told I can't have water here. I can't have bread here. 
God said, I can't do that. Now think of this. Now we're seeing this in the physical sense. But remember, we also have to look at things because the Bible above all else is a spiritual book. Who is the bread of life? Jesus. Who talked about the rivers of living water? Jesus. And so think about it. We have a man of God here. And he says, no, I can't come into your palace there, King Jeroboam. You're an evil, wicked king. And I'm not going to have your bread and I'm not going to have your water. I see there's no gospel there. There's no gospel in Israel right now under King Jeroboam because they're worshiping false idols. And they've got phony priests. And he's declaring his own feast days out of his own heart, out of his own mind. There's no gospel there. There's no water. There's no living water. There's no bread of life there. Do you see where I'm going with that? And so here's this man of God that just says, no, I can't come in. I can't eat. I can't drink. And look what he does in verse 10. So he went another way and he returned not by the same way that he came. Now we see the man of God being very obedient to God. He's acting in a God-glorifying manner. So, so far, this is where we're going to leave it for tonight. We see this unnamed prophet so far declaring what God told him to do, prophesying, and then having God heal the king from that withered hand, the hand that was frozen, and then turning down the king because he said, I'm not supposed to be with you. No. What fellowship does light have with darkness? We've heard that in the Bible, haven't we? God separated the light from the darkness. And if there is no bread, and if there is no water there, then this man of God wants nothing to do with it. Now, having said all of that, we're going to stop for tonight. Let me encourage you to read the passages that I threw at you. And I know I threw a lot at you. God was throwing a lot at me. But for us to properly understand the context of what we're doing, um, it's really important to read lots of the Bible and put things together because the Bible fits together as a cohesive whole. And part of the problem with interpretation of the Bible, and especially with prophets, they'll take a verse here and they'll take a verse there and they'll spout on it and expound on it and they twist it all around. Somebody had mentioned earlier, they just twist it around for their own good, for their own purposes, for their own version of the truth. There's only one truth. It's God's truth. And unless the conclusions that we come to agree with what God says, then we don't have truth. And so I, I pray that you were blessed by this first Bible study. Um, next week it gets a little easier because we really get into it. We're going to find out that this man of God really makes a mistake. He makes a mistake. And then we're going to see another prophet of God come on the scene, yet another unnamed prophet. And so if you want to read ahead in 1 Kings 13, please feel free to do so and see the rest of the story. I pray that this has been a, a relaxing study for you, but it's caused you to think. I, I pray that it has encouraged you to search the scriptures, read the Bible, study the Bible. There's nothing better that you can do, nothing else more important than you can read than the scripture. If this has blessed you, and you want to share this or any video I make, please share it with someone who may be benefited from this because this is the Word of God. It's nothing to do with me. I don't want credit for it. I just want to teach and preach the Bible as God gives it to me. And I want to share that with you. And I want to encourage you on your walk with Christ to stay in the Word. So I want to thank you for being part of our first Bible study. And Lord willing, I'll see you on Sunday for our Sunday message. And then Lord willing, next Tuesday at the same time, we will continue our study in 1 Kings chapter 13. And until I see you again, God bless you.